Okay, so thanks, Yuda, for organizing all this. It's amazing to see all of you here. I'm really happy that everyone came, and especially folks who uh, flew in from outside of the country. Um, I guess I'm actually one of the people who's furthest, who came from furthest away. Uh, so, um, uh, well, anyway, so thanks everybody for coming, and I guess we can get started with the actual uh, uh, school. And so uh, I thought we'd start with just a very broad overview of uh, bilinear maps and elliptic curve crypto and kind of talk about the general topics that we'll discuss uh, in the school. And uh, then we'll jump into right into the materials and uh, Nigel's going to uh, lead us off with elliptic curve crypto. Okay, but uh, let's start at the beginning. So in the beginning, when public key crypto started, Basically, you know, in the beginning there was the line, the projective line. Uh, so public key kind of started with uh, using arithmetic, uh, modular arithmetic, finite fields, um, you know, denoted by F FP or FP star. Um, and of course, when this came out, you, you all know this, this came out like 35 years ago. Uh, lots of amazing applications emerged, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, public key encryption, dig digital signatures, and everybody was happy. And for a long time, uh, this looked like it's gonna be the main um, tool that's going to be used in crypto, but there's also kind of a dirty little secret about arithmetic modular primes, and that is that the discrete log problem in this group is actually not as hard as one would like. In fact, there are sub-exponential algorithms, I'm sure as you all know, and that causes uh, lots of problems in practice because it forces the parameters to be larger than they need to be. So the question is what to do about that, and there have been many proposals over the years to kind of use different types of groups. So who says we have to use arithmetic modular primes? Maybe we can use a different uh, type of group, and, and people have looked at discrete logs over extension fields, matrix groups, class groups of number fields, uh, and so on and so forth. But in many of these examples, Basically, either the, sub, the discrete log problem has a sub-exponential algorithm, or the group operation itself is very inefficient, so you end up with inefficient uh, crypto systems. So that's kind of where things stood. And then, uh, sometimes in, in, at some point in the mid-'80s, um, Victor Miller and Neil Koblitz had this really neat idea to say, hey, there are all these other groups that come from algebraic geometry. These were far less known objects in the mathematical community, but nevertheless, these are things that um, have now, as you know, become kind of mainstream in crypto, and the, the, the idea was, hey, let's use these groups to run our, dis our uh, discrete log-based systems. And the beauty of these groups is basically there's no, no known sub-exponential algorithm in, on most elliptic curves, which makes them perfectly suitable for this uh, settings, and they also have an efficient group operation. So um, again, if you haven't seen this before, this is what an elliptic curve looks like. Um, and uh, as I said, Nigel is going to talk about this in much, more gr in much greater detail. So here you have an example of an elliptic curve. If you draw it over the reals, this is what, this is what it looks like this for this particular curve. Of course, we use these curves over a finite field where this picture doesn't really make sense, but at least you get a sense of what, uh, what these things look like. And the reason they're so interesting, again, I'll say this very briefly, this is just an overview of what we'll discuss. I'll say this very briefly and then we'll get into, into other material, um, is basically that security scales much nicer uh, with the security parameters. So for example, if your symmetric key system uses 128-bit keys, if you wanted to achieve security comparable to 128-bit keys using finite field arithmetic, you have to use really, really large primes, something like a 3,000-bit prime. Okay, so that's actually a problem. I mean, large primes mean slow operations, whereas the beauty of elliptic curves is the curve, just the, the, the size of your prime, the size of the parameters only have to be 256 bits, so not much larger than your symmetric key size. So that's kind of the motivation for elliptic curve crypto, and that's why Nigel is going to torture you with elliptic curve uh, math for the rest of the day today. Okay, so day number one basically is all about elliptic curve crypto and how, why, how these elliptic curves work, how the crypto systems work over these elliptic curves, what are attacks on the discrete log problem, and so that's basically going to be, that, that's going to be most of day number one. And as I said, basically most of the crypto systems over FB star translate to elliptic curves, so we actually get, um, you know, um, um, systems that we have seen before, just with more efficient parameters. And I just wanted to mention, these things are not just math, they've been actually de deployed quite widely. If you go to Google today, uh, they're actually using elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman for their main uh, key exchange mechanism. Okay, so it's interesting that they use a combination. Their, their, their cer certificate is an RSA certificate, but the actual key exchange mechanism is done using elliptic curves. Okay, so it's actually deployed quite widely. All right, so that's day number one. So uh, it turns out, though, that these elliptic curves actually have remarkable properties that simply don't exist in FP star. Everything I've said so far basically translated things that we did in FP star, just translated, translated them to the group of elliptic curves. 
Here, uh, it turns out that some elliptic curves actually have additional structure, which is extremely interesting and very useful for crypto. So this additional structure was first pointed out by uh, Vail, Andre Vail, back in the uh, 1940s. Interestingly, he did this work when he was in jail. Um, this is kind of a nice story in, in his biography. He, was, uh, he calls himself a conscientious objector in that he refused to, uh, to uh, serve uh, as a soldier in World War II, so he got thrown in jail for that. And he says that this was the, he was like in jail for like six months. He says this was the most productive time of his life, to the point where he was going to write a letter to the head of the French Math Society requiring that every mathematician spend six months in jail <laughs> at some point during their lives. <laughs> so in particular, what he came up with in jail is this thing that we now call the Vey pairing, uh, which basically is a map that takes two points on the curve, <clears throat> two points on the curve, and maps them into some finite field extension over which the curve is defined. And this map is bilinear, and I'll just state a simpler property of bilinearity, which is what's relevant to crypto, which is basically that if I take a point on the curve, and I multiply, so here, a, a point P on this curve, basically just means it satisfies, the point is a pair XY, and it just satisfy this, satisfies this equation that I just showed you on the last slide. And what this pairing uh, does, it basically, it's what's called a bilinear map, and bilinearity means that if I multiply the point P by an unknown uh, scalar A, either on the left or on the right, I multiply on the left by A, multiply on the right by B, then uh, these scalars actually come out of the parentheses. Okay, so that's kind of the magic that makes all of uh, ellipt uh, bilinear map, bilinear crypto, uh, pairing-based crypto rather, uh, possible. This magical map here. Now, this by itself would not have been particularly useful. The amazing thing that um, Ve actually, if you look at his original paper where he defines this pairing, he actually went and did a bit more work to give a definition that lends itself to computation. And in fact, Victor Miller showed that the pairing that he gave is, in fact, efficiently computable. It's basically kind of an exponentiation algorithm. Okay, so you'll, you're going to see that how this works actually in the third and the fourth day of the workshop. So, uh, to go into a bit more detail, um, the way, what these, uh, so, so we're not going to, we're going to abstract away from uh, elliptic curves now and kind of talk more abstractly about, about bilinear groups. So kind of the nice thing about th this uh, setup is you can do a lot of work in pairing based crypto and not know too much about elliptic curves just using the abstraction. Um, so that's one of the appeals of pairing based crypto. So what is a, bi why does it, what is a bilinear group? Basically you have a, a group G and a group GT and um, I guess I'm just going through a very high level uh, intro at this point, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, just so that you see what's coming in the next couple of days. But trust me, we're going to get into a lot more details in the, over the next four days. So right now, this is just a very, very high level overview of the things we will cover in the, in, in, in the school. Okay, so back to bilinear groups. What is a bilinear group? Basically, we have this group G, which we call the source group. We have this group GT, which we call the target group. And the idea is this pairing, you can see, takes two points in the group G and maps it, maps it into one point in the group GT in such a way that, as I said, the map itself is bilinear. So these exponents kind of come out of the parentheses. And more importantly, it's computable and it's non-degenerate. So non-degeneracy is actually a very important property for requirement for, this, for these bilinear groups, because clearly a bilinear map that just maps everything to one clearly is bilinear, but it's not a very useful map for any, for any practical purposes. So what we require is that if G is a generator of the source group, then the pairing of G and G is a generating of the generator of the target group. Okay? That's all we mean by non-degeneracy. So far so good? So I imagine not all of you have seen this, and so that's why I'm going slowly. And so, as I said, the examples essentially come from elliptic curves where uh, the group G, the source group, is the group of points of an elliptic curve. And the target group basically lives in some extension field of, uh, of FP, over which the curve is defined. Okay, so that's basically this magical mapping that makes, makes all of, makes all of pairing-based crypto works, work. And as I said, as you can see here, basically there are different, different, many different types of curves uh, with, diff with mappings into different extensions. Um, and those are, kind of, uh, those are the kind of the groups that we use. Okay, so the pairing is defined over elliptic curves. The output of the pairing takes us into a finite field. All right, so pairing-based crypto, is, as you know, is kind of mushroomed into a huge, huge area. And we're going to cover, we're going to spend basically days two, three, and four covering, covering kind of the latest and greatest results, actually going from the basics to the latest and greatest in, in uh, pairing-based crypto. So uh, Allison and I are going to talk about uh, identity-based crypto, attribute-based encryption, functional encryption, chosen ciphertext security, and so on and so on and so forth. So we'll talk about all the variants of encryption. 
Um, Anna is going to talk about privacy applications of, of pairings. So she'll talk about eCash, um, anonymous credentials, uh, and so on. And then uh, Jens has these amazing results to show how to do non-interactive zero knowledge very efficiently with uh, pairings, uh, succinct non-interactive arguments. And so Jens will take you through um, uh, through those constructions, and uh, yeah, and you'll see. So you'll see the details of how all this works. And the goal here is basically to prepare you kind of for doing research in the in the field. Uh, so you know, we'll try to make we'll, everything that we cover. We'll try to kind of uh, cover it in a way that op opens up uh, research problems for you to think about when you leave the school. So, in this high-level overview, I couldn't not give any technical details. So I wanted to give, uh, if you hadn't seen this before, if you've never seen pairings bef before, I just wanted to give you the simplest example application for pairings. Um, Again, just in case you haven't seen it, and just so that you were kind of prepared for what's coming uh, in the next couple of days. Okay, so let's look at one example application of pairings to crypto, just to show the power of pairings. And the simplest example I know of is what's called the BLS signature. It's due to, uh, well, myself with uh, uh, Ben Lin and Hulav Shaham. So let me describe what the, how the signature works. Again, it's a very simple application of pairings. You know what, actually, I think it would be helpful for the rest of the speaker if we do a quick show of hands, just so that we can understand people's backgrounds. So how many of you have not, have you not, how many of you have, you have not seen BLS signatures before? A fair number. OK, so that's actually good to know. So that's a good calibration point. OK, good. Um, excellent. So let me go through this uh, slowly so everybody understands how this works. And as I said, we're going to go into a lot more detail in the next couple of days. So in the signature scheme, so I assume everybody knows what digital signatures are. That I'm not going to explain. <laughs> okay, so the signature scheme works as follows. So key generation is really, really simple. The secret key is basically some number x, uh, you know, just a value mod q, some x in zq. And the public key is just g to the x. Nothing special there, just kind of like uh, DSA signatures, secret key is x, public key is g to the x. Now the way we sign is really, again, really, really simple. All we do is we use a hash function from the message space onto the source group. And the way we sign is we hash the message that gives us an element in the group g, and we just raise it to the power of x. It's the simplest, simple signature as you can imagine. Hash the message, raised to the power of x. The question now is how do we verify these signatures? So far we haven't used the pairing at all. And so the way to verify a signature, what we do is basically if you give me a message and a signature, what I'll do is I'll write the equation here and I'll explain why it works, is basically we pair the generator g for the group with the signature, and we compare that to the pairing of the public key and the hash of the message. So now let's expand what these uh, two terms are. Let's expand the term on the left and the term on the right. Well, by definition, the signature is just the hash of the message to the x. Okay, so this is a pairing of g and h of m to the x. That's the term on the left. What's the term on the right? Well, again, by definition, the term on the right, the public key is just g to the x, by definition. So we're pairing g to the x and the hash of the message. Now you wonder, why are these things equal? And the reason they're equal is because you notice what I told you, the exponent x basically comes out of the parentheses. So the exponent x comes out of the right hand, of the right hand side, it comes out of the parentheses, and it goes back into the parentheses on the left hand side, and by bilinearity, those two values are equal. Okay, so you can take exponents out and you can put them back in. And really, in a lot of ways, the, fact, the reason pairings are so useful is because you can move the exponents around from one side of the pairing to another, and that makes a lot of things work, which were not possible without pairings. Okay, so you can see that basically this allows us to verify signatures. I hope this isn't too quick for people who haven't seen this before. Yes, was this clear? It actually helps if people nod. <laughs> so yeah, uh, good, good, good. So uh, fine. So we have a really, really, really simple s signature. The question, of course, is why is this secure? And you know, there's a really simple theorem you can prove that under the computational Diffie-Hellman assumption, the signature is secure in the random oracle model. Although interesting, is, again, we're going to talk about that tomorrow, there are ways to expand this signature a little bit so it becomes actually secure even without random oracles. And so again, we'll see that tomorrow. So, so far so good, so we have a really simple signature, but that by itself is actually not so interesting. We had lots of other signatures before. We can even build signatures from just general discrete log groups, like the digital signature standard and so on. So why is this interesting? Well, first of all, you realize that um, the signature is really short. The signature is just one element in the source group G, yeah, just one element, and in fact, these elements can be only something can be only 20 bytes to achieve general, you know, uh, an acceptable acceptable level of security. So we actually get a really really short signature. And in fact, this is kind of uh, the world's uh, shortest uh, signature. It's been used f because of that property in a bunch of applications. 
Uh, so that's one interesting property of, of, these, of these signatures. And the other property is, again, something that we haven't seen with discrete log type signatures, is that it's actually fairly easy to aggregate a lot of signatures and compress them into one. So let me explain what I mean by that. So how do we aggregate uh, these signatures? So imagine, imagine the following settings. We have n users. So each user has his own public key. So public key 1 is g to the x1, public key n is g to the xn. So we have n public keys. And then we have n messages. And each user, so user number one signs message number one, user number two signs message number two, and so on and so forth. And I wrote down the signatures here. Okay, so now we have n signatures on n different messages by n different users. And it so, so it turns out that we can take all these signatures and compress them into a really, really short signature that's as good as all the signatures combined. Okay, so that's why it's called an aggregate signature. And how do we do this compression? Well, it's really simple. All we do is we take and multiply all the signatures together. All right, so again, this is something that we haven't seen in discrete log-based schemes, but is, po is possible in bilinear settings. Basically, taking all these signatures, multiplying them together, the point is that the aggregate, this aggregate S, this one, one value is, in fact, enough to convince a verifier that all messages were signed by all users. Again, message number one was signed by user number one, and so on and so forth. And this, again, is useful in a lot of settings. It's actually not being used today for one re reason or another, but it is useful in actually a lot of different settings. For example, if you have a certificate chain you can take today, a certificate chain has a different signature at every level, you can take all those signatures, compress them into one, and shrink the, certifi the certificate chain. Uh, in bitcoins, bitcoin, for example, when you uh, move coin from one person to another, basically today they append a new signature for every transfer of of, of coins. Well, you can take all those signatures and compress them into one and make the coins uh, short, uh, shorter. And similarly, there's a classic protocol called BGP that you can compress signatures there as well. So the question you should ask me is, how do you verify this aggregate? Where do, how do you uh, possibly verify that this aggregate um, properly signs all the incoming messages? And so I think it's a good exercise just to kind of sh get you used to thinking about pairings just to see how we do that. So I'll do that here. And again, we're going to discuss it in much more detail later tomorrow, but this is a, a nice overview. So let's see how we verify an aggregate signature. And there are lots of steps in the verification. I'll just show you kind of the main one. So here's the main verification step. So we have our aggregates, which is capital S. Okay, so this compression of all the signatures that we were given. And we simply pair that with, um, with, uh, what? with this value. Ah, this is supposed to be a G, not an H. Sorry, there's a typo here. We pair that with the, with the value G that's, uh, this, that's used to define uh, the public key. And then that's on, the, well, that's on one side, so one pairing on one side, S and H. And on the other, other side, what we do is we pair the hash of all the messages that were signed with all the different public keys. Again, this is supposed to be G to the XI. Okay? And we take this product. So let's see that this actually properly verifies. Let's just check that verification works. And there's also a security theorem associated with this. So let's see why verification works. Well, so let's expand both sides. If we expand the left-hand side, well, actually, let's start with the right-hand side. The right-hand side, basically, the signature, S, is literally a product of signatures. So it's a product of HMI to the XI. OK, everybody agrees? The product, the S, the capital S, is just a product of all the single signatures. And each single signature is just H of MI to the XI. So we have a product of these signatures. That's the right-hand side. Now let's look at the left-hand side. Well, the left-hand side, basically, again, we have HMI, to the HMI paired with the public keys. The public keys are H to the XIs. This is what a public key is, or should say actually G to the XI. Now we can do the same trick we did in BLS verification. We can move the XI from the left-hand side of the pairing to the right-hand side of the pairing. Actually, from the right-hand side of the pairing to the left-hand side of the pairing. Okay, so you can see the XI just moved from right to left. All right, and now you start to see why these two expressions are the same. Basically, it looks like things are almost the same, except that on the right-hand side, the product is on the outside, and on the left-hand side, again, I'm mixing my right and left. On the left-hand side, the product is on the outside, and on the right-hand side, the product is on the inside. Well, that's fine. That's, we still have equality exactly because of the bilinear, bilinearity property of pairings. Okay, bilinearity means that products and pairings commute. So these two, these two terms on the left and on the right are equal. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right, very good. So 
So far so good? So this kind of shows you the power of the, of just a very, very simple example of how these pairings are used and why they're so powerful at building uh, crypto systems just because we can play these games with, with exponents and, and kind of get things uh, A, to verify, and B, we use these properties also in proofs of security. Okay, so that's, as I, as I said, a very simple example. We're not going to uh, uh, come back to this, but uh, it's a good example of how pairings work and how they're used. All right, so the next question is how uh, the pairing algorithm actually works. And so on day four, Florian is going to tell you a lot about, um, well, you know, what is a pairing? How does Victor Miller's algorithm work? Um, how do we optimize it? And this is just n not just math and theory. In fact, there's a lot of practical optimizations that go into this. And in fact, there are many... Um, uh, libraries out there that implement pairings, and there's kind of a, a race in kind of building the fastest uh, implementation of, of, of pairings. And so for practitioners in the audience, I can tell you there's a Java uh, pairing-based crypto library, there's a tiny pairing-based crypto library if you have, um, you know, uh, resource constraints on your, on your hardware, and, you know, there are many different implementations at this point. So Florian is going to tell you more about uh, implementations of pairing. Pairings. Okay, so so far so good. So now we kind of uh, know the know where we're headed, um, and we, we know as we, as I said, we'll see many many applications of pairings uh, to crypto. It's a very active area, but it turns out we can even do more. So back in 2003, I wrote a paper with uh, Alice Silverberg, kind of saying, "Hey, you know, it's kind of cool that we can do all these things with pairings." But in fact, if we had more than a pairing, we could do even more. If we had something called a k-linear map, not just a bilinear map, but a k-linear map, in other words, a map that uh, operates on k-tuples rather than just pairs, <clears throat> so it maps k copies of the group G into the group, into some other group, uh, let's call it GK, and it's got the same properties. It's non-degenerate, it's efficient, and it has a hard discrete log algorithm, hard discrete log problem. If we could do that, then all of a sudden lots of problems that today we don't know how to solve with pairings become easy. So for example, uh, we can do group key exchange, optimal group key exchange. We can do optimal broadcast encryption. We can do attribute-based encryption for circuits. This is a recent result of Sahai and Waters. Um, and so if we had a K-linear map, a lot of magic, magical things become possible even though we couldn't do them with pairings. But the question was, can we actually construct these K-linear maps? And Perhaps some of you know, but there was actually a very recent breakthrough in crypto. This is just from, uh, from this past couple of months um, by, Gar by Garg, Gentry, and Halevi that basically showed an example of something that's not quite a k-linear map, but is functionally equivalent to a k-linear map. Okay, so uh, why is it not quite a k-linear map? It's because the representation of group elements is randomized. So it's not quite... Um, so, the, so the, 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 you know, the, the source group is not quite a clean uh, group that we can work with, but rather uh, elements are kind of represented with noise, so they're, um, the representation itself is randomized. Uh, the larger the K is, so the more linearity you want, the larger the representation is in the source group. This is going to be important for applications. Uh, again, we're going to talk about applications of K-linear maps uh, also throughout the week. Um, but I want you to remember this. The larger, the, the more linearity you want, the larger the description of uh, the elements are. And finally, it actually does more than a K-linear map. It does what, what's called gr gradation. And I just wrote, wrote a, a really simple example of gradation that's actually even more general than this. But basically what it allows you to do is kind of build, it kind of, you can build a tower of pairings, not just, you don't, you can, you don't just need to map K-tuples into a, 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 simple, a single group, but you can actually um, kind of map them uh, slowly, one step at a time. Okay, so you have a tower of pairings that you can use. If you can co compose all these pairings together, basically you get something that's equivalent to a K-linear map. So this is really exciting. There's actually a lot of activity in the space right now, uh, kind of capitalizing on these K-linear maps and so on, solving problems that we couldn't do with bilinearity. So the school actually, there's a very opportune time because it's a really kind of exciting time in the field, and there's a lot of research to do, and I'm sure the next couple of years are going to be full of um, uh, results using these, using, using these tools. And so what does the future look like? As I said, there's a tremendous amount of work, a tremendous amount of research problems, uh, basically on extending and enhancing these bilinear constructions that have been developed over the last decades, but using now k-linear maps. So things that we couldn't solve with bilinear maps will actually probably get solved with k-linear maps. And again, as I said, we'll give examples um, throughout the week. 
Um, but even uh, beyond that, there are there's a large industry. There's a lot of large efforts, kind of translating bilinear results into um, uh, lattice, lattice techniques, in particular constructions based on the learning with error. Um, and there's a, a lot of success in that. There's a lot of you know many constructions from bilinear from the bilinear world have been translated, but not everything has been. And so there's again fantastic, fantastic open problems. For example, we still don't know how to do three-way Diffie-Hellman using learning with errors. We still don't know how to do broadcast encryption using learning with errors, even though all these things we, can, we now know how to do with pairings. So there are still very nice open problems here in terms of building things using bilinear techniques um, uh, for, for uh, learning with errors. And as I said, uh, you know, throughout the week, we'll try to expose these open problems. And you know, I hope some of you can actually solve them. But before we can work on all these open problems, we have to understand how bilinear constructions work. And that's really what the school is about. Okay, so I'm going to stop here, and with that I'm going to hand it over to Nigel, who's going to tell us about the basics of elliptic curve crypto. Thanks.